need, I need to talk about cartoons. I think we all take for granted just how easy it is to make stuff these days. I'd consider myself an amateur animator at this point. The first animated thing I ever made was in this video from a while back, and even though it might look complicated, that's just because of the fancy compositing. The animation itself was pretty simplistic, all things considered. The goal here was to come up with a unique looking 2D, 3D hybrid style. I absolutely love traditional animation, but I'm not nearly patient enough to do it myself, which is why I'm actually completely 3D. You're looking at a screen grab of the animation viewport in Blender right now, and this is what it looks like rendered. The blue lines are to differentiate the character's outline from the background, and the red skin and green shirt are so we can create separate masks for the two different textures of paper. Then we just motion track the face, so that way the paper moves naturally with the movements of the character. Sam was the one who figured all that stuff out, and he's my VFX guy, I pretty much just stick to Blender. Hey Sam, oh, oh, that was unlocked? Yeah. All right, well, did my explanation cover everything? Yep. So, when I say something like animation has never been easier, am I saying that any of this was easy? But what I am saying is that it was accessible. Blender and DaVinci Resolve both cost a combined total of zero dollars. Resolve has a paid license for 300 that'll get you some fancy features, which admittedly we did pay for, but all of the effects demonstrated here are available in the free version. The fact that a couple of amateurs can watch some tutorials on YouTube and figure all this stuff out without paying a dime is insanely cool. The tools to create pretty much whatever you want have never been more readily available, which is why we've seen such a renaissance of independent animation in recent years. But it didn't used to be this way. Heck, just going back 10 years ago and Blender's 2D animation tools were still in their infancy. Going back 20 years, DaVinci Resolve doesn't even exist, and Blender 2.3 is basically unrecognizable from what it is now. You could still make some pretty impressive stuff with it, especially for the year 2004, but it was far from intuitive. And if you know anything about Blender, that's saying a lot. Going back 30 years to 1994, and the production of the original Toy Story is nearing completion. For being the first feature-length 3D animated film, it holds up surprisingly well. Most of the time, at least. But the visuals aren't the part I find the most impressive. It's the fact that this movie even exists in the first place. Back in the 80s and 90s, Pixar was most well known for their animated shorts, such as Luxo Jr., which you probably recognize, Knick Knack, which was remastered in 2003 to be a little bit less... a little bit less, or Tin Toy, the one with the most terrifying baby that has ever existed. Surprisingly, they didn't actually get their start as an animation studio, even though it was always their goal to become one. In fact, these shorts mostly existed as a tech demo to show off the Pixar image computer, which was designed with purpose-built hardware for displaying 3D graphics. Before they made movies, they made computers. Really, really expensive computers. If you've ever wondered why Steve Jobs had anything to do with Pixar, now you know. The production of Toy Story would have never been possible were it not for the animation tools that Pixar's engineers built from the ground up, hardware included, and it all started with one Ed Catmull. You might know him as the now-retired president of Disney Animation, where previously he served as the president and co-founder of Pixar. And if you know anything about me, you might know that I'm not a fan of giant publicly traded mega corporations. I think they're uh, very bad, actually. We'll touch on his business philosophies later, don't you worry, but before he sat in an executive seat, Catmull was a software engineer with a focus on computer visuals, something which at the time he studied it didn't really exist. A few years after receiving his PhD in computer sciences, Catmull drew the attention of George Lucas, who brought him on to work as the head of the newly founded Lucasfilm computer division called the Graphics Group. It was staffed with the best and brightest in the science of making a computer show you an image that 1979 had to offer. And while the original Star Wars featured a teeny tiny bit of computer generated visuals, yep. there it is. 
Lucas realized that CGI wouldn't really be necessary for its sequel. Instead, he had Catmull and his team focus on developing what would eventually be called Edit Droid, one of the first pieces of digital video editing software ever. Prior to non-linear editing on a computer, film reels were physically edited by cutting and pasting strips into the finished product. The ability to do this all digitally was probably a pretty big deal. And while Edit Droid was undeniably groundbreaking, it isn't what I want to focus on here. And not coincidentally, Catmull and the rest of the graphics group felt exactly the same way. Everyone in the lab was in awe of Star Wars. One weekend in the summer of 1977, during one of their excursions to Manhattan, the group took in a matinee of the film. It amazed them so much they saw it again that same day. They assumed they could only dream of getting a call from Lucasfilm. To their frustration, although Lucas now had on his payroll perhaps the world's top technical talent in 3D animation, he wasn't asking the group to do any. His special effects group at Industrial Light and Magic saw no use for computer graphics either. Boy, the irony of Industrial Light and Magic, who are today the most ubiquitous visual effects studio in Hollywood, seeing no use for computer graphics is kind of hilarious. Indeed, from the standpoint of computer graphics, Lucas's second Star Wars film, The Empire Strikes Back, was a step backward from the first. It included no computer graphics at all. It became pretty clear fairly early on that there wasn't a lot of enthusiasm that we thought there would be inside Lucasfilm for computer graphics. Where it was extensively utilized was in Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. Paramount Pictures commissioned the Lucasfilms graphics group to create this one-minute sequence, which required months of work, with contributions from some of the era's greatest minds in CGI. This might look pretty primitive by today's standards, but in 1982, audiences were blown away. But I want to go back even earlier, to a 1976 sci-fi thriller called Future World. I won't go into the story too much here, but its main plot centers around a fictional megacorporation creating artificial humans for entertainment, and a sequence in a control room full of computers features this little animation on most of its screens. It was created by Ed Catmull and his classmate Fred Park in 1972 as part of their postgraduate course in computer science, and it is widely considered to be the first piece of computer-generated 3D animation ever. It's kind of astonishing to think that in less than 10 years, we went from this to this. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that the research paper that spawned this little video kind of changed everything. Computer animation was sort of on the lunatic fringe at that time, said Fred Park, a fellow PhD student in Catmull's class who also worked on animation. People were just barely to the point where they could get a computer to put out still images. It was obvious that it would take years for the state of the art in computer hardware to catch up with this ambition, and there was no end of problems to be solved on the mathematical and programming side. Nonetheless, from Catmull's point of view, there was no better time or place to get started than right here and now. In 1972, 3D modeling software obviously didn't exist. So, in order to create the 3D model, a mold of Ed's hand was cast out of plaster. The surface of it was coated in latex, and 350 polygons were meticulously drawn onto it. If this thing still existed, it would be in a museum. But, according to Catmull... Unfortunately, um, the, the hand hasn't survived. Part of it was because, over time, latex turns into a goo. Although, I, I wish I had actually cleaned, cleaned it off and kept the hand. Every single point of every polygon had to be mapped out before it could be rendered in 3D. This machine that Ed is using in the video was a mechanical digitizer, which provided a readout of each X, Y, and Z coordinate as three distinct numbers, which were captured with... Uh, a mouse. Or a mouse. For some perspective, according to Catmull's research paper, this entire hand was covered in 350 total polygons, and each polygon had three vertices minimum for max. There ended up being 270 intersecting corners, times three coordinates, that's 810 data points to keep track of. For those unfamiliar with 3D modeling terms, I'll use the default cube in Blender as a reference. This point here is a vertex. It's where two edges, which are the lines that make up a polygon, intersect. A polygon is a flat surface composed of edges and vertices that join together. So the face of this cube is a polygon made of four edges and four vertices. A four-sided polygon is usually called a quad, with a three-sided polygon called a tri. This hand was made of 350 polygons in total, so not only did they have to graph out every single point on this model, they had to manually measure the X, Y, and Z coordinates of every single vertex of every single polygon. 
With everything in this process being as manual as it was, it should come as no surprise that rendering the animation into something you could actually watch was manual as well. When I'm done with the video, I go to the render page in DaVinci Resolve, uh, then I hit the render button, and, and then it, um, and then it renders it. But digital video codecs didn't exist in 1972. Remember, this is back when computers were barely able to display a single static image, let alone real-time playback on a video file. Just getting a look at his imagery was a task in itself, because the display hardware never showed the entire image on screen at any one moment. It took 30 seconds or so to cycle through the image. Catmull could see a frame of his work only by taking a long exposure Polaroid of the screen and looking at the snapshot. Once he was satisfied, he then shot the footage using a 35mm movie camera that the department had rigged to take pictures of a CRT screen. This passage makes it sound easier than it actually was. I've been digging around through research papers to try and find exactly how this photography rig was set up, and they all gloss over that particular detail. But to put it into perspective, each frame of this animation took about 30 seconds to display on the computer screen because the computer only had enough memory to show a sliver of it. This means that in order to see a single frame of animation, a rolling slice of the image was slowly displayed over the course of 30 seconds, and a long exposure photo was required to see the entire frame all at once. They couldn't just hit play and turn the camera on to record it. They had to wait for every frame to be fully exposed before they could move on to the next one. I think it's a bit of an understatement to say that this experiment was ahead of its time. These days, it seems like the second a new piece of technology shows up, every Fortune 500 company drops everything and restructures their entire business around it. <clears throat> the metaverse, <clears throat> NFTs and cryptocurrency, <clears throat> AI-generated text and imagery. <clears throat> Who knows what's next? My money is on artisanal bread making. But back in the 1970s, computer graphics were seen as more of a neat little experiment than anything revolutionary. They were very disparaging about it, how what they were doing was wildly impractical and didn't have anything to do with the real world or whatever. I thought it was great because I knew that we were off into something really big and, and somehow these people were, were missing it. In fact, in computer science departments across the nation, computer graphics was not considered a legitimate area of research. It was an application that's off to the side. But graphics wasn't legitimate. They couldn't imagine what would happen when we were producing so much data that we needed other ways of being able to, to see and understand what they were working with. Eventually, after receiving funding from Steve Jobs, Ed Catmull and his co-worker Alvy Ray Smith would co-found Pixar, breaking away from Lucasfilms and focusing on independent animation work. Alvy Ray Smith would then go on to be royally screwed over by Steve Jobs and kicked out of the company, but that's another story for another time. Catmull's goal from the very beginning, even in 1972, was to use computers to create movies. And I don't think Pixar gets nearly enough credit for being able to do what they did. Yes, they are credited as the studio that made the first fully CGI feature-length film, but the steps they had to take to get to that point don't get talked about nearly enough. 3D animation, as it is now, can largely be traced back to the pioneering advances made by a small handful of people, and most of them worked with Ed Catmull at some point or another. Sure, Blender can be intimidating at first, but you can only learn how to use a tool if that tool exists. And in 1991, when Toy Story was officially greenlit by Disney, most of them didn't. A lot of the characters you see throughout the film were hand-sculpted into giant clay busts and digitized with a probe using a much more advanced version of the same process that Catmull used to create the model of his hand. 3D modeling has never been easier. With all the technology we have access to now, I could do all of that on my iPad. Nomad Sculpt is only 15 bucks, which is still insane to me considering everything it can do. It's the only digital sculpting tool I've ever seen where you can just kind of pick it up and start using it. You don't need to take a course just to navigate through its menus. If you tried learning Blender or ZBrush but couldn't figure out its sculpting tool set, this is definitely your next best bet. If you have an iPad or an Android tablet, at that price, there's really no reason not to pick it up, even if you're just curious about making art. I'm not sponsored by them, I promise, I just, I just really like this program. Making the model itself was a pretty simple process, but it was sculpted with dynamic topology. You don't need to know what that means, all that matters is that if we look at the mesh, it is not animation ready. That's where the process called retopology comes in. What I'm doing here is essentially recreating the model with a cleaner grid of polygons by drawing them on top of the original one. 
which is also in an app on my iPad called Cozy Blanket. Reed's apology is normally an obnoxious, time-consuming process, but look at how easy this is. Comparing that to physically probing every polygon manually, and it's actually kind of relaxing. And in just a couple hours of work, I've got myself a little woody. Anyway, Catmull's contributions to computer imaging are still being used to this day by me right now. On his Wikipedia page under the Known For section, it lists the algorithms he helped to develop and it doesn't even mention his time spent as company president. And I gotta say, it's pretty refreshing to see somebody in an engineering position who actually understands the industry, because he kinda helped build it, put into an executive position instead of some callous, unfeeling businessman. What's that? Pixar's animators, despite being widely regarded as the best in the industry, were typically paid less than their contemporaries at other studios? And not only was this well known within the company, but there was collusion with Lucasfilm to ensure that employees wouldn't be recruited away from Pixar or vice versa, and that both companies were artificially limiting their salaries? And additionally, as president of Pixar, Catmull ballooned this agreement into a cartel of other animation studios as well as Silicon Valley businesses such as Apple and Google that fixed employee wages, something which is not only anti-competitive and illegal, but when questioned about it, he callously refused to apologize for? I should stop repeating everything you say verbatim and suddenly receiving information via phone call in a heavily scripted medium is an overused trope and that acknowledging the trope doesn't actually make it funny. Okay. Yeah, I love you too. Bye-bye. To quote the Bloomberg article that broke this story, Catmull said he saw it as his duty to insulate Northern California film companies from salary bidding wars that drive costs up, move the animation jobs overseas, and destroy the US industry. Like, somehow we're hurting some employees? We're not, Catmull said. While I have the responsibility for the payroll, I have the responsibility for the long term also. I don't apologize for this. And while I can understand his position, San Francisco is pretty famously one of the most expensive places to live, and Pixar kept breaking box office record after record. But playing devil's advocate here, he does actually raise a decent point. Pixar to this day doesn't outsource any of their animation to lower wage countries. Anything that could possibly be done in-house is something that cannot be said for basically any other production company, so they have to be doing something, right? And who knows, as a studio operating under Disney, it wouldn't surprise me if their executives were trying to cut salaries to decrease budgets. Pixar's number one operating expense is wage, after all, that's the main reason their movies are so expensive. Now obviously this is a pretty complicated issue that goes beyond the scope of this video, so I'm dramatically simplifying things, but I kind of feel like, and this might be a controversial opinion here, but the people who actually make the movies should probably be appropriately compensated for making the movies. I'm looking at you, DreamWorks. Whether you enjoy their more recent output or not, and if you say anything bad about Luca, I will make fun of you, Pixar well and truly pioneered 3D animation as a medium, something that the entire world gets to benefit from outside of entertainment. And it all started with a handful of brilliant engineers who just wanted to make movies. <coughs> if you liked this video, I'd love to turn it into a series of sorts. The history of 3D animation is pretty fascinating and one that I don't think gets nearly enough recognition. I've seen a handful of videos talking about animation itself, but hardly any going into the people who made it or how it was actually made. If that's something you want to see, please let me know in the comments. This isn't shallow engagement bait, I legitimately just want to know what people want to see out of this channel. Uh, if you enjoyed this, you'll probably like our video on the newspaper comic turned webcomic Heathcliff. No, 